Hello and welcome to today's webinar, where today, of course, we're talking all things um, stamp duty land tax. Um, just trying to invite my uh, my guest speaker. So today I'm delighted to um, to introduce uh, David Hanna, who is um, the founder of a company called um, Cornerstone. So he's he personally is a, is a chartered tax accountant and advisor, a lecturer in stamp duty land tax, and the founder and CEO of of, of Cornerstone, this specialist um, specialist stamp duty land tax advice. So welcome, David. How are you doing? You're right. Fabulous. I'm very well, except I can't hear you at the moment. So I'm just going to switch over and make sure I just get you to, to speak again to me if I could. So you're muted at the moment. Apologies, David. You're muted. Try that. Well, that's, that I can't working? hear you now either. Apologies. We're having slight issues. My problem oh. as well, actually. So let's just... Um, check we're doing this correctly. I'm just going to check this is correctly there. Um, apologies, David, I can't hear you at the moment. I Paul, can you hear me now? And now, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. So, a slight panic there for a moment. So, this is David. <laughs> Welcome, David. You've probably been able to hear him a little bit on the way through this. And I haven't been able to hear him. Yet, so, a bit, of a, a bit of a nightmare. But, um, welcome, David. How are you getting on? I'm all right. And um, I hope everybody else is out there as well. Amazing, 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 amazing. So um, just to kind of let the sort of audience get to know you a little bit, can we just um, perhaps just ask you a little question about kind of well, why, why did you set up Cornerstone? Kind of why stamp duty? Kind of what is it that, um, that meant you felt this was the right thing to do? Stamp duty has been one of those interesting, what I call Cinderella taxes. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the sense that it replaced the old stamp duty, which was a duty on documents, which solicitors understood very well uh, and introduced a lot of self-assessment principles which solicitors don't understand very well. Accountants always regarded it as a solicitor's tax. The solicitors were treating it the same way as the old stamp duty and we felt that there was a, a, literally a gap between the two stalls which we could fill by developing an expertise base from experienced accountants, tax advisors and trainee solicitors to fill that gap with the with the necessary expertise to ensure we got stamp duty right. Mm. And I guess kind of with stamp duty becoming such a big part of the acquisition fees on the way into a, or the acquisition kind of costs on the way um, buying development site stuff, I guess kind of comes quite an important thing as those kind of rates have, have kind of rocketed, haven't they really? So um, amazing. Well, let's let's jump into it, shall we? Should we um, just perhaps have a little kind of update on, um, on where sort of rates currently are at the moment? I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for you. Um, and if you want to just kind of share yours at the same time, um, that's a little update in terms of kind of what are the current rates and what are the kind of the key things that might, and then kind of those top five ways to save, save stamp duty if we could. Okay, so let's get into this right now on the there top go, five strategies for saving stamp duty. But as Paul has just said, quick reminder about the rates. We've gone through this holiday, which is now being phased out, although the bulk of the benefit um, for residential dwellings disappeared essentially on the 1st of July. We currently have rates that are 0% to 250,000, 5% to half, up to 925, 10% between 925 and a, and a million and a half and over one and a half million, 12%. That will snap back to the old, or what I call the normal rates um, on the 1st of October, um, which is the right hand column of the table you can see. It's important to remember, however, if you're acquiring residential property, that you have the 3% rate for second homes, or if you're a corporate acquirer, a 3% rate in all cases. And since the 1st of April, we've had this new 2% non-resident surcharge. And I was quite shocked yesterday. I had a phone call with a client in France buying a property in the UK and his solicitor hadn't even told him about it. So wow. there seems to be a, a, a lack of knowledge. And there are quite a few um, bear traps in the new surcharge, which I'll go into in a minute. If you're buying commercial mixed use property, the rates haven't changed. There haven't been a holiday. You're still paying a maximum of 5% on anything over 250. So overall, it's still more beneficial. If you look at the, I'll call it the potential maximum rates, you could be paying 17% now uh, 
on, on a residential property, uh, whereas you could be paying 5% on a mixed use. And I don't know about you, Paul, but I can remember when VAT was 17%. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, actually, it was 17 and a half. And a half. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's round it down for the purposes of dramatic, <laughs> dramatic impact. <laughs> Right, right. So, so that's, that's if you're buying a residential property over one and a half million quid and you're buying for a company and perhaps someone's non resident, something like that. That's kind of when you can start getting to those you, 17% rates that could be 5%. Yeah, you, you start to get into some, some really chunky numbers. Um, you know, you, you're talking about putatively uh, 1.7 million on a 10 million pound house in Chelsea. Um, now, whether that's going to prove a massive disincentive to the, <laughs> the foreign buy market we'll have to wait and see yeah yeah totally. um but certainly it's not going where it where it may impact uh, on your users is people who are buying say a relatively expensive house which they then intend to demolish clear the site put flats on it or put multiple um smaller houses on yeah, so yeah. it has I'll to be that in mind yeah totally so Let's just talk about the 2% surcharge. The first thing to emphasize, it only applies to wholly residential property. Again, we get into this, if it's not wholly residential, then it's mixed use. You don't get the 2% surcharge. You don't get the 3% surcharge. And indeed, you don't get the 12% rate. You get the 5% rate. Interesting. Can I, say, can I just, can I just um, dwell on that? Because the it's the fact that it's not residential rather than the fact that maybe it's commercial that's kind of i think a, a key thread that's going to come out which i just want to kind of pick up on your choice of phrase there i think that's quite well important. i'm a tax guy and people often talk about commercial it's not the commercial rate of sdlt it's the non-residential non rate <laughs> yeah absolutely um the, the the tax operates by exclusion in the sense that if you're you're, you're assumed to be residential unless you're evidently not in yeah. whole or in part, in which case you drop down into the lower rates and you drop yeah. out of all these surcharges. Okay. Importantly, with the 2% surcharge, and I think this is, is relevant, it applies to all non-resident persons. And I'll come to what non-resident is in a second, but that includes individuals, partnerships, trusts and trustees, companies, including UK companies, if their shareholders are resident overseas. And there is a relatively narrow list of excluded companies. And the important point is that the test for residence is not you're not a British passport holder. Uh, it's simply that you haven't been resident in the country for at least 183 days in the 365 days preceding the date of completion. And this is going to impact on some I think unintended targets, um, the first of which is uh, offshore energy workers, long haul air crew, many of whom spend more than six months or 183 days a year outside the UK. And they conceivably are gonna end up paying a 2% surcharge on their new home when they buy it. Uh, and surely that wasn't the intention. I mean, I th but there is no blanket exclusion for British passport holders, which I find strange nor is there any emergency exemption for what in tax terms is described as exigent circumstances. If you've been locked down overseas yeah. for, the for the last year, you are now non-resident and will pay a surcharge if you buy a new home in the UK prior to your having been back here for six months. I mean, that's absolutely bonkers. I have a colleague who's been locked down in New Zealand since February last year. I mean, the upside is, is that she's been exempt from income tax for the whole of 2021, but, you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> yeah. In fact, she's just, she's just sold her UK house and she's told me she's not going to buy another one until she's been back here for at least six months. So, yeah, <laughs> surely that was never the intention. But anyway, oh, moving onwards, what are the top five areas that you're user base and the audience probably need to consider when looking at deals well the first one of course is multiple dwellings relief does it apply multiple dwellings relief applies obviously to dwellings dwellings in the course of construction or conversion it applies to permitted development buildings where conversion has started and by conversion i mean works of construction so even the barest amount of strip out by the vendor means that work has commenced and it also 
uh, applies to bare land with planning permission. And there's been a case before the tribunals a few weeks ago, and we're eagerly awaiting the verdict on that because clearly if it can apply to greenfield sites, that opens up the scope for this relief considerably. Secondly, we call it mix it up. Look for those elements that make the land not wholly residential. Interestingly, you can combine mixed use or commercial land with multiple dwellings relief. So even if you're paying 5%, you can get it as low as 1% by making an MDR claim, which can be quite useful. Remember, if a property, if a dwelling is not habitable, it's not residential. And we'll get into a little bit more of the detail on that in a minute. And if you need to get on and do works prior to completion of contract, do an option rather than a conditional contract. If you exchange a contract and go on site, you substantially perform and you bring forward your tax payment date. But if you take an option, you haven't taken a contract. So you can go on site under the option and do whatever you like without triggering substantial performance. And don't forget, there are 44 reliefs. Uh, in fact, there are 49, but I've knocked five off the list for discount purposes. And the audience will be thrilled to hear I'm not going to go through them all in detail today. So let's talk about the habitable or not question. The first thing to emphasize again, stamp duty falls to 5% from 12, 15 or even 17%. If the property is not suitable for use as a dwelling, there was the Bewley case on this, which was a property that was marketed as being ripe for refurbishment. In fact, it was completely uninhabitable and to boot made of asbestos. So the whole thing had to be demolished and a new house built. And that pretty much set the benchmark for uh, what habitability meant. What was interesting in that case was that the revenue and the Bewleys were actually arguing over whether or not the 3% surcharge applied. So when the judge handed down his judgment, he actually not only handed the beauties a win, but he also gave them a refund because they paid residential and should have only paid non-residential <laughs> rates. Um, habitability is actually measured in terms of could you live in it? Uh, so it must have a bathroom, it must have a kitchen, it must have toilets. That's an absolute bare minimum. If it has anything uh, less than that, then you're starting to think maybe I'm not suitable for use as a dwelling. Helpfully, Section 7 of the Housing Act 57 gives a specification of suitability um, for human use. And that was reinforced by the Human Habitation Act 2018, which actually extended the range of things, which would mean that a property could not be let to a tenant because it was not suitable for habitation. So quite useful things to benchmark against. And as I said, if you can't let it under the Human Habitation Act, then it's not a dwelling for SDLT purposes. Quite a useful thing to hang your hat on. In relation to other reliefs that will concern the development and investment community, house builders or property traders, and I stress that property traders have to be a company for that purpose, who are buying from personal representatives, probate purchases, part exchange properties where the vendor is buying a new home from a house builder stepping in to restore a broken chain and i suspect that the end of the holiday will cause a few chains to break down or buying where employees are relocating their employment not been popular during lockdown this one but it could change in all of these cases you're a hundred percent exempt from sdlt subject to certain expenditure limits but it's worth probing what the vendor's doing and who the vendor is and and that because we did one during lockdown which was a 1.86 million purchase and we managed to get it 100 percent exempt from sdlt so you can imagine a big smiley face uh, on the client at that but, point Dave, does that need to be um entirely you have to hold that in a company you have to buy it in a company so the house builders and the property traders are both the same thing got to buy it in a company and then all these reliefs apply if you're doing these things Yes, absolutely. Um, as I said, you have there's a there's a maximum expenditure limit which you have to stay inside, but necessary safety expenditure is excluded. 
um, rather whimsically, the word necessary safety expenditure isn't isn't actually defined in the Act. So, I mean, for example, if you move into a house and the electrics have been decertified, then rewiring is a safety expenditure. If the gas boiler has been condemned, replacing the boiler is a necessary safety expenditure. Um, clearly, replacing missing floorboards necessary safety expenditure i mean arguably you're still at the, you're then in the non-residential anyway but these are the sort of things you have to have to go into um i'm not i'm not involved in building or, or myself but i can imagine quite a list of things that would make a property unsafe uh which might conceivably get you over the maximum spend limit and um, it's important here that you have to trade the property so you have to do this do your work and remarket it. However, if you cannot sell it on within a reasonable time frame, there is nothing to prevent you selling it to another company in the same group. That still qualifies as a disposal for the trading company. So you can conceivably do this for properties that you try to remarket, find you can't, and decide to either redevelop or retain for letting but you have to make that second disposal. Options, and I'm going to talk about options in two contexts, is any acquisition that has been made subject to a reservation agreement, an exclusivity agreement, a lockout agreement. <laughs> They've got many different terms for which you have paid. And options, also rights of preemption, are distinct from the land to which they relate in certain circumstances, therefore, because the option is taxable in its own right as a standalone when it's combined with the exercise it can create mixed use um, not an uncontentious area i have to say but <laughs> nevertheless that's what the law appears to say now the biggest benefit to developers is this as i've said the ability to use options till you can start work on site and you don't trigger substantial performance because the substantial performance rules only apply where there's an exchange contract, not the grant of an option. And you might conceivably use an option, go on site, do preparatory works. If there's an existing building, you might start to demolish it. You might take the roof off and then at completion, you've definitely got non-residential. There are certain things, certain timings where you can use this to your advantage but not least of which is you don't suffer the cash flow disadvantage of having a conditional contract which you've substantially performed a lot you know and it can be used the other way around which is you can actually trigger substantial performance and this was more relevant prior to the 30th of june but if if anybody if you've got an exchange contract for a house and you enter into occupation then you could trigger the stamp duty payment inside the holiday. Um, we often called this outsourcing Kevin the teenager because if you sent your teenage child to live as a lodger in that house that you're buying, that would have triggered substantial performance, yeah. ironically. Um, so you finally found a good use for that truculent little bugger who sits in his bedroom all day playing games. So there you go. <laughs> Um, I'm, I've got, I had one like that. He's now my chief technology officer, which proves his life wasn't wasted playing uh, World <laughs> of Warcraft. But the key pitfalls to avoid when buying land and buildings without planning. Single dwellings as sites for redevelopment as conversion. Make sure they're residential first. Again, look for way leaves, substations, any form of telecoms, towers, or et cetera, or any form of commercial or business income coming from the land. That will trip you into mixed use, which is really useful. Does that include all... people, you know, often you see kind of people trading from their home as, I don't know, massage therapists, something like that. That, that kind of, that, does that kind of get to that sort of level, or is it more about actual sales from the land and this sort of stuff? It's more about the use of the land than the use of the house. The revenue don't accept use of home as office, for example, as being evidence of commercial use. And I, yeah, I get that. Uh, but if, for example, um, you've had to have your kitchen extended and made over because you're running a commercial bakery business. Um, I've seen one case where the 
garages were in fact a woodworking workshop and the chap who the vendor was actually a carpenter and joiner and he used it for pre-assembling stuff so there was definitely trade there look for evidence of commercial planning permissions because there would have to be a change of use over part all of those things add up to the idea that mm, this is not wholly residential uh the most exciting one i've seen in the last six months on that was a 3.2 million pound house that had six garages with a separate entrance and when we raised the query why is this house as as, as beautiful as it is and as substantial as it is why has it got six garages and the vendor solicitor replied oh well my client runs his racing team from it <laughs> that's got to be commercial use you would argue yeah, yeah. um so that was that was a quite a happy event quite a happy client and if you can get if you i always say to people if you're intending to demolish the property anyway if you can get the on under an option or get the vendor to remove the roof of the property take out all the armored shanks render it unsuitable for use there's nothing wrong with that if you're intending to demolish the property if you intend to go in and put them back within a few weeks that is highly controversial and i wouldn't advocate it now if you're buying land with planning well again you've got to use the options versus conditional contracts you can get on site and do things you can start works and of course, if you start works at completion, you can claim multiple dwellings relief. Quite our demonstrandum, as they say. So that's and that can be cool. it's just purely starting works so that can be very yes. limited in terms of, you know, all of our um, customers do a lot of commercial conversions. There's a load of strategies that kind of cover all that. And so if yeah. you purely get the, the building stripped out by the tenant that's left, then that's the start of the implementation of the work, for example, under a, a change of use. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you're looking at permitted development type buildings, as I said, quite often the vendors, if it's a commercial building, quite a lot of strip outs been done. Usually, <clears throat> quote, if it's got any money in it, it's been taken out, but false ceilings, partitions, partition walls. I even saw one building where they'd taken the HVAC equipment and the lifts, which I thought was a bit extreme, but there yeah. you go. Um, you know, usually there's been some strip out anyway, but if there hasn't, uh, this is an opportunity get, get your option, go in, start stripping out one floor. You've commenced works of conversion. So what can developers do? Evaluate your deal property, do pre-deal evaluation advice, sometimes before you've even put your offer in, because you can maximize your tax reliefs and your tax payment timing by avoiding substantial performance and claiming MDR look at the MDR, look at them um, for <clears throat> single residential purchases, look at those four, four trader reliefs because they could conceivably get you where you need to go. Always structure yourselves tax efficiently. Um, again, this is about a lot of, see a lot of people use SPVs, uh, but they use individual SPVs rather than having a corporate group. This doesn't help SDLT particularly, unless you're doing a trader sideways shuffle. But it can help if you're trying to, if you've realized the profit on a development, you've now, it's all stuck in SPV1. You need that cash to do a new deal, but you don't want to do it in SPV1. Getting that money out and across to the new SPV is expensive in tax terms, unless you've got a corporate group. So a holding company and multiple subsidiaries. It's not rocket science. Most accountants will know how to do this. And look at deal efficiency, timing. You can get, we've explained how you can get on site without triggering substantial performance. If you stage your site assembly, if you are doing a site splitting deal, for example, you're going to buy 10 acres from, uh, what do they call the National Rail Authority these days? I don't know, but Network <laughs> Rail. You're buying 10 acres from Network Rail. You're going to buy it speculatively, keep half and sell five acres onto your buddy. You've got a pre-agreement, but you're going to pay 5% on the 10 acres, get the value uplift, and then he's going to have to pay SDLT again on the five acres he buys from you. If you actually buy the five acres speculatively, but under a 
nomineeship so that you're essentially a joint venture at the point you buy the land, you both pay your share of the 5% SDLT. But when your partner takes his five acres, you're actually just revoking the Bayer Trust and there is no SDLT on that. So using those sort of commercial structures and commercial paperwork can save a double charge. And finally, if you've already done deals, have a health check done. Ideally have it done immediately post completion, but certainly within 12 months and look to see whether a relief has been missed. Uh, and it's in some cases you can go back four years, particularly on uh, multiple dwellings relief conversion, conversion multiple dwelling relief and um, stamp duty on incorporations and connected party transactions because we frequently see people paying tax when they shouldn't do uh, and get it back for them. Now, in terms of investors and private clients, again, look into your reliefs. Look at when you're changing the legal state, if you're incorporating, disincorporating, moving by gift or contribution and sale to connected parties. A lot of solicitors assume that these are at cash or at market value. Very often, because of the presence of maybe a partnership or some other ownership vehicle, the stamp duty actually is nil. And we're recovery, as I said, we're recovering money on a regular basis. Um, Transfers from limited to or from limited companies, trusts, including pension schemes, sales between family members of trading or investment properties, and indeed their own homes, are generally free of SDLT, uh, which is quite often ignored. Even if there's cash passing, the SDLT can still be nil under certain circumstances. Where there's more than one individual involved, and this has been going on since 2007. And as I've said, most solicitors ignore the issue. So a lot to go at, a lot to think about, uh, but definitely worthwhile thinking on current purchases and project evaluation, get a, get a really tight analysis of the property. And, and to use the phrase, get your advice in early. If you can't do that, or if you've got historic stuff, still worth having a health check. Thanks. And that's where I hand back to you, Paul. Yeah, of course. Cool. So what I thought I'd do next is just try to bring us to life a little bit with um, looking at, so, so one of the key things that sort of one of the key themes that's come through from, um, from this session is just this kind of comment around what options are really useful and, and being able to, um, to acquire stuff under option allows you to, Look at things like um, it being a, a non-residential use. You can get kind of low sample duty rates on the back of that. And so part of the trick to to getting people to a lot, of, a lot of questions I hear is kind of well, how do I how do I get an option? What's what's kind of the um, sort of what's the way in which I can kind of persuade someone to do that? Because obviously what you're typically doing with those sorts of deals is you're having a, a longer period between exchange and completion. And you're you kind of got this kind of this this twilight zone. Well, how why would someone want to kind of jump into bed with me for a, a twelve month sort of planning? Um, purchase rather than just selling it to somebody else that's got to come a quicker quicker turnaround and and the answer to that is is really kind of boils down to some very simple first principles I wanted to kind of just share with you now and just then talk about what strategies you can apply and how that how we can then benefit from these reduced stamp duty rates off the back of those in effect and and these are apologies are a bit simple we're going to kind of build on these going forward but the obvious first principle around how you can drive value into a particular site is of course Firstly, intensifying a use. So this is this kind of principle that you buy a house, you knock it down, you build a block of flats on it, in effect. Provide you that in the right areas, you're going to drive the values up on, um, on the site, of course. The second thing you might do is, of course, change the use of it. So you might drive the value up by taking an office building that's worth 150 quid a foot, for example, flipping it into resi that's worth 500 quid a foot, thanks very much, that works. Or you might be refurbishing stuff. So you might be looking at this new class E and, and kind of buying a, a tired old office and making it grey day office space, something like that, or perhaps flipping it into service accommodation maybe now, nowadays. If, of course, we do those things in sustainable locations where we're then submitting applications in line with the character of that area, then, of course, this is then how we start to get consent, get support from the local councils. We drive value into the site, which means that the value of the site with the planning ticket you're going to go and get all that you've already got is then worth more than the existing use value of the site as it currently sits. Then with that additional planning game that you're creating in effect you could share some of that with the owners which then says well actually if you come into this sort of 12 month period with me then I will share some of that uplift that I'm going to create 
that then means there's a reason for them to, to take that longer period of time. That means you'll get your option agreements um, signed off the back of that and you, you'll be much more creative with the subject to subject to planning or the, or, the, or the option agreements that you ask for, which then opens all these opportunities up. And of course, within, within that, if you're driving the value of the site up and you can also then buy it under an option agreement where you're then going to save stamp duty as part of that, you could even share some of the savings of the stamp duty with the, with the, um, with the owner too. So of course, all of this coming together then creates opportunities for us to, to, to do all this. I thought, well, the next interesting thing it would be is just to talk about why deals fail, because that's, again, kind of how does that, what is that a thing? And really, there's only kind of two reasons for me that, that deals kind of fail. One is that you can't get planning for the thing you're looking to try and do. So I go and try and option up this, this house, I try and put a block of flats in it, I don't get consent on it. That's the first way in which you can fail. And of course, the second thing is that simply the steep schemes doesn't stack up, frankly. So what's very clear then is if we can set ourselves up to succeed, we can apply strategies in effect, by, by preempting those problems and then not looking at sites that haven't got those, that have got those problems in effect. We're, we're not wasting our time looking at all of that stuff that isn't going to work. We're only focusing on stuff that does. So the way we do that is that we, we quite simply look at searching in areas with value. So in effect, we're looking, if we're going to increase the density of the site, we're going to refurbish um, or, or change of use, change of use of buildings. Then we only search in areas where the values are high enough to. If we increase density, we drive the land value, which pushes the, the land value up. Which means then we've got enough in the in the appraisal to be able to share the uplift with the with the owner. Or if we're going to change the use of the building, we're not looking at buildings that are too expensive and too valuable, so that it all kind of gets a bit marginal when you start running your account. So well, I can broadly pay you what it's worth if you come on a twelve month journey with me. It's like, well, I just sell it as it is, thanks very much. It's just kind of wasting my time. So, so if we're searching at the right budget of buildings for those commercial conversions, if we're searching in the right areas where we've got the attractive land values, then we can drive the value of part of that. And that then means we're going to be successful when we start asking for these, for these changes, for these, um, these option agreements, all these kind of creative ways to buy these buildings. Indeed, that's then how we can claim our MDR. All this kind of stuff is because we've, we've got this inbuilt increase in value as part of it. If we then... When we're searching for our sites at the start and we're outbound letter campaigning and this sort of stuff, if we're aligning what we're looking to do with the planning policy in those areas too, so we've got a supportive planning policy behind the scenes, we're driving values up at the same time, then of course we then get to that point of, well, does it work or not? Then we've hit the headlines as part of that. That then has the consequence that I'm talking about here, which means you can, you can bid more than existing use value to incentivize the owner to come on that journey with you, which then means that you can, you can get your option agreements as part of that. And of course, if you have multiple exits as part of, of what you're looking at, whether you're perhaps considering even perhaps having a, an HMO option as part of it, or a kind of a, a build to rent, or a, rather sort of a straight out um, sale, of course, then of course that also drives um, sort of further opportunity for you. And one of the biggest tricks I always find is, and sort of I, I can never kind of put a slide together without this, is, is just reminding ourselves that a great design team will be worth their weight in gold. And actually, what the reason you, you need those is that that great design team will know the local planners. And in effect, what they'll do is they'll build the right schemes for the right price on the sites that you're looking at. In effect. All of this really kind of drives into the strategies that we that we, we sort of talk about here at Nimbus, which is is really kind of based off this very simple journey. In effect, where what we're looking to do is is create a strategy looking for particular types of building that then align with a policy that sits and pushes the open door in effect, creates an open door for the schemes we're gonna be putting forward, where the, the values stack on the, on the back of that. Simply then we go and find the sites, which is very simple through the, through the eight ways to find land and the, and the, um, and the eight uh, elite plus strategies. And then we simply check whether those buildings are on the market or indeed mail campaign for those. Um, and off we go, thanks very much. This is a list of the, um, of the eight elite plus strategies that we've got. And I want to just kind of just dwell on these for a moment because the whole principle of all of these is that you're going to drive value into the site as part of as part of the development work that's being being put forward and it's then aligning it with the policies that are in place now what we've got here is the first three these are all the new airspace pd rights that were announced um, last year in september so it's kind of the it's the airspace above these buildings and and really for the sort of the number two and number three which is the airspace above flats or indeed the airspace above houses of course those typically provided we're searching in areas that have got high enough value and those sort of those filters are being pre-applied on, on the basis of these strategies anyway. So it only kind of shows you buildings in areas where those values are high enough. Then of course those will naturally drive an additional value into that site, which means that if, if you go forward and say, well, I'm buying under option, 
Um, I'm going to get this planning consent. It's a, it's a prior approval, so you kind of want to get your consent. It's not the same as the old PD rights. I'm going to come on to those in a second. It's the old prior approvals. So the new prior approvals, are, so you, you want to get your planning consents in place as part of that because they're, they're kind of like a watered down planning application effect. But there's, there's a fair bit of work to go into to getting those. So those two strategies naturally will drive the value up as part of, of, as part of that process. The first one is the class ZA. So that's the, the, the commercial building where you knock them down and rebuild them as flats with two stories on top. And, and those then have, as part of it, baked into the search an uplifting value in effect because the value of the, um, of the site when it's built is, is significantly more than um, the cost to buy it and knock it down. And it drives more than 25% return on cost. In effect. And those are kind of pre-baked into them. But those, all of those three strategies really want to be going forward on the basis of some sort of subject to or some sort of option agreement. As I say, there is value built into those schemes as you go. The one that um, naturally sits very comfortably with multiple dwellings relief, in fact, number, number four and five are both sort of naturally sort of sit alongside that, where number four is the shop's buffer. So this is kind of class G PD rights, where you can take a, a retail unit on the ground floor and you can put two stories of flats, sorry, two, um, two flats above that ground floor retail unit, in fact. That's the old... PD rights, which, which are then very simple. They're kind of a, a sort of a notice period and it's a very quick thing to go and get, get consents on. There's a kind of a, um, a, a deemed approval at the end of that. If the council don't deal with it quickly enough, then you get a deemed approval to go and do that work. And of course, that then will be very simple when you start to get to look at buying those sites and saying, well, has the work started or not? Well, when the shop tenant leaves, and this is kind of identifying the, the commercial space above that shop unit, when the tenant leaves, of course, they will do that strip out. They'll take all their fiction fittings out as part of their fit out in effect, which means that your, your multiple dwellings relief will then be possible to claim as part of that. Strategy number five looks at low value commercial buildings. This is really kind of the, the old class O um, PD rights, but a number of other things really as well as part of that, where in effect it's looking for commercial buildings that would naturally convert to residential, there's a residential field all around them. The values are low enough compared with the residential values all around those, those buildings to allow you to then um, in effect, Get your planning consents to change those uses. The old class O is where you might get away with um, with that sort of PD right, the old PD rights as part of that, and those are, are within that strategy number five. But typically, they should be pretty uncontentious um, changes of uses. Quite frankly, you may well find that if you're not doing the offices out of those out of those so like strategy number five, that the other uses around there, you might want to get a planning consent on those, which then means you're you're into options. But of course. All of them have that, that financial viability, they have that residential feel, they have that kind of natural open door to go and get a planning consent on those, of course. Strategy number six then is about is houses where you can, in effect, knock them down and, and, and create more, or indeed just look at the, the units to the size of kind of side gardens, corner plots, back gardens, and that kind of stuff, which, which would naturally sit, um, again, with those, with those options agreements. Again, it's going to drive value into the sites. It only searches in areas where the values are high enough to drive a land value, which means that you can start to share some of those plot values with the, um, with the, with the vendor, which means then they'll, they'll jump into bed with you on that subject to all that, all that option agreement. In the elite system, there are eight ways to find land. And the natural stuff to think about with this really are, are the, sort of the visual site searches. These are the kind of the, the corner plots, back garden, side garden, different way of finding those from using the strategies on the elite plus system, but it's a very effective way of doing that. Kind of naturally um, looking at those in, with the option agreements and that sort of stuff. The PD rights is kind of how you can find the office buildings, how you can find shops as well, and look at those conversions. Obviously, with the new class MA coming out, we've got a new strategy being launched this month um, for class MA specifically. But again, that will be a, um, a prior approval rather than the old school PD rights that um, we've been used to with the class M's, class G's and, um, and class O's that we've been so used to historically. So there is a more of a formal planning application process compared with the old with the old process. But of course, things like the, the stuff where you're looking for to site for the planning ticket for a number of dwellings or for, for new build schemes for, for whatever that might be, of course, those then just thinking about when you're when you're buying those sites, just think about when you buy them, what happens before you buy them in effect. As, as David said about, you know, if, it's, if this is a house with a consent for, for 10 units, something like that, then just thinking about when am I buying that house? And if I am buying that house and I'm keeping it, then that's one thing. But actually, if I'm going to knock it down and, and do something else with it. Then when I buy it, I ideally want it to have no roof or no bathroom or no kitchen, something like that, because that will then come out of, will, will then come into a um, sort of a non-residential uh, stamp duty stamp tax rates rather than the, the full-on residential um, rates in effect. 
So a number of ways in which that can be can be useful, hopefully. Right. So, David, um, quick question for you, then. If we've had these um, these sort of plans or we've, we've bought sites, things like that, and, and we've missed those um, those opportunities and perhaps we've you know, we've paid full on 17 percent stamp duty or something like that on on a site that we think might get away with multiple dwellings or might get away with um, non residential. What, what do we do? Well, you can go and do literally do a, a, what we call a forensic review. In other words, look back. Um, we can evaluate the site, decide what release would have been available and then submit a reclaim to HMRC. Um, provided we can get it within the time limits. Um, as I said, this is why I emphasize better sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, we've done in the last 12 months, just over 14 million in refunds from HMRC, um, identifying particularly missed multiple dwellings relief claims on PD buildings uh, and quite a lot of connected party stuff as well. Right, cool. So you've got 12 months or four years, depending on, on the um, on the position, is that right? Yep. Um, and in the case of connected parties, you could be up to 17 years. Wow. All right. Okay, cool. And then case studies. Okay. Well, basic uh, multiple dwellings claim, uh, land acquired 1.475 million. The non resi rate was 63,250. We had planning permission in place to convert them to 15 new flats and a retail unit. Therefore, there was actually a mixed use multiple dwellings claim that could have been made and we made a reclaim and got 40, well, 40,573 pounds back or two thirds. How did we do that? Well, you take your chargeable consideration, calculate the original figure paid. You then do your multiple dwellings calculation, which is to knock out the commercial element, which was about 235,000, divide by 15. Consideration per dwelling is 82,000. That is clearly below the threshold. So you apply a minimum rate of 1% to it, giving you 823 pounds a unit, multiply it back up by the number of units, 12,340, add on the non-residential SDLT, 10,334, and that's how you get to your figure. And that's fundamentally how you do a multiple dwellings calculation where there's some uh, commercial or non-residential element present. So quite a result, nice result. We like the one. Brewery court, again, land office building, 800,000, 29,500 paid commercial rates. Planning permission, six flats. Uh, and to add two additional flats whilst retaining a, a, a small amount of office space. And again, this is uh, you know, the reclaim on 29,500. Again, was roughly two thirds, 20,000 pounds, which is again, was worth doing. And the calculation proceeded in pretty much the same way. Keep clicking, Paul. But uh, <laughs> and that's how you do it. Um, I mean, clearly, if your consideration per dwelling is over the, the the nil threshold, then you calculate it accordingly. But that's broadly how you do it. Uh, and it, it's it's quite chunky. I mean, I've seen some larger conversion buildings come down from 4.96% right the way down to 1.03%, which is nearly an 80% recovery, which is pretty good. And it's kind of part of the trick of that is knowing that because that has a significant amount of money when it comes to, you know, whether you win bids or not, whether you can actually acquire sites or not, because if you're, if you know you're paying 1% stamp duty rather than 4% stamp duty, you can, you can pay 3% more on the purchase price. And most, most bids are, um, are kind of that's, that's a significant increase in terms of your bid going into the uh, into, a, into a purchase price. So well, yeah, yeah. It, it allows you to sharpen your sharpen your pencil a bit in the bidding process. It also means that your project evaluations going in when you when you make applications for finance, you're showing the right amount of working capital in the deal to be applied to the land purchase, which can affect sometimes the, the sheer cash flow viability of a project. Uh, I've had, I had one client in, in, in Manchester and uh, literally that 3% represented close on 300,000 pounds, that 3% difference, which made a tremendous difference to their borrowing because they were using not the cheapest lender in town. It, it, the thing rolls on and, and ultimately drops to bottom line profitability on the project. Okay. Okay. So, 
David. Yeah. Is it, I mean, I, the one, the number I'm proud of there is, is the 24 cases. We, we've recovered half a million for Nimbus clients. It's, it's not all about big deal stuff. It's even the small deals that, that uh, you know, £20,000 per Nimbus user is significant. I can't emphasize this enough. Rates 15 to 1%, assuming you're resident in the UK. Yeah. And what we do is we charge 25% of the tax saving that gives full indemnity cover under our PI. So if we're wrong, come and get us. And the same fee on a refund, the difference being of course, that we don't charge the fee until we've got you the cash back. Cool. Fabulous. So let's just kind of jump into, we've got some details there we can fire through. We'll put some, um, we'll jump onto that in a second. This is you guys here, isn't it? Let's just so, so in terms of um, what we can do um, going forward, if you would like to, um, if you'd like to see um, Nimbus doing this stuff, you can you can claim your fourteen day free trial of the Elite platform. Um, I'm going to put up a poll in a second. If you want to want to access this, we can you claim a fourteen day free trial with us. Um, you also do a one to one tailored demo, so we'll show you how to use the system to set yourself up to get your strategy right. Um, we do have a um, a webinar which introduction to Nimbus, which just follows straight on off this actually. So if you're interested in that, we can um, we can get you signed up for that and just roll you straight onto the um, onto that introduction to Nimbus in a second. Um, and we can do the have a property deals clinic that's starting at one o'clock today as well. So we'll kind of want to come back to that. We can look at those too. Um, David, in terms of your help, let me just scoot you back. I think I've skipped across that bit. Apologies. I want to just run right. through how um, how you guys can can help. Well, yes, as that's as we've said, we can do a pre-completion, indeed, pre-deal advisory service, evaluate what the tax liability will be. If we can improve over your first estimate of SDLT, we charge 25% of the difference. That fee is payable on completion of the deal. So if the deal doesn't go ahead, you don't get charged. Similarly, if we're doing a post-completion review, we charge 25%, but only when we recover the money from HMRC. So again, there's no upfront cash commitment, no advance fee, merely let us, let us do the work, let us do the analysis, and then we will deliver you a result. Fabulous. So we're going to jump into a Q&A in a second. There's a bunch of questions um, in the Q&A, but let's just, um, I'm going to launch a quick poll. Dave and I are going to get ourselves ready. Um, to, um, to answer your Q&A in a second. Just give us two, sec two minutes just to go and do that. Um, we're going to launch a poll in the meantime. So if you want to access the, um, mm -hmm. let me do that now, just two seconds. So if you'd like to have a follow-up call with Cornerstone, that first question is for you, just a, a sort of no win, no fee um, uh, call with them. That first question for you, if you'd like a, a free one-to-one -one demonstration in the Maps Elite platform, that second question is for you. If you'd like to um, take the 14 day free trial of Nimbus Maps Elite platform, that third question is for you. If you'd like to attend our introduction to Nimbus Maps um, webinar today at 11 o'clock, that fourth question is for you. And if you'd like to attend our deals clinic this afternoon, um, that fifth question is for you. Dave and I are just going to take a short break for a moment while we get ourselves ready for, your, um, for the QA session we're going to, going to cover in a second. Um, we'll be back in just one moment.
Fabulous. Right. So I'm just going to um, get David back if we can. There we go. So I'm going to finish that poll there. Just end that for a second. Now, David, we've got um, there's a whole bunch of questions I think that you guys have covered. Um, so I'll skip back through to the live Q&A um, page there. Um, there's a, a bunch of questions in the Q&A itself. If people would like to raise and actually kind of ask a, a live question, then if you look in your control panel at the bottom, there's a little, a little hand button, so it says raise hand. And um, if you can click on that, what that should do is it should give me a little alert on um, my system here to, um, to say we've got some questions. So Harvinder's got a question there. Let me just see if we can get um, Harvinder up. Let's stop the share. Hi, Harvinder, can you hear us okay? I can indeed. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. How are you doing? Slightly. Yeah, doing well, thank you. Um, great presentation, by the way. I have a... Um, a question, I don't know whether it's relatively basic or not. Um, I've been an HMO uh, investor for around about 18 years. However, the multiple dwelling relief uh, point kind of made my ears prick up somewhat. Um, so I was just getting, I had a basic question really. Um, some properties that I have looked into uh, in the past, um, they are quite large. So the play was always, should I convert it into a Swedish area's property or uh, look at creating multiple dwellings, so multiple flats? So based on what you're saying, uh, could I put an option agreement in place with the vendor um, or potentially share again, um, get them to remove the kitchens and bathrooms and effectively make the property un uninhabitable to then take advantage of uh, multiple dwelling relief? Or am I mistaken? I think arguably you can. I think if you're taking a single dwelling, rendering it uninhabitable and then carrying on with the conversion into multiple dwellings, you would argue that is the commencement of works of the conversion. Sure. If you are going to buy a single dwelling, render it uninhabitable and turn it back into a single dwelling. No. Okay. Um, but I mean, it, again, I, it, I would stress if you're doing that, particularly with a residential dwelling, um, because there's no such concept as permitted development. Make sure you've got your planning permission before you complete. Okay. Thank and you. I guess I mean, there's probably a question in there that um, where my mind was going was is kind of what is the what is the scheme that you eventually you eventually go forward with? So is it in my head? You know, is it a twenty bed HMO or is it three six beds or is it you know, or four six beds or something like that? Kind of what is that? What is that scheme? Because four six beds, presumably, David, would be four dwellings rather than a 20 bed HMO, presumably one dwelling, is it? Depends on the configuration of the HMO. Um, uh, for example, I've seen some HMOs that have um, literally an ensuite bathroom and a cooking facility in the corner, um, sometimes called a capsule kitchen. And then there is a shared lounge and a shared kitchen. And there is a very strong argument that because all of the facilities are contained within the HMO room, that that is a dwelling in its own right. Right. Yes, the, existence, the, the existence of communal areas like communal kitchens and lounges is actually supplemental rather than um, to, to the existing dwellings capabilities. You often see that style um, in cluster apartments for students, for example, where there may be eight or nine study bedrooms with a communal kitchen uh, a communal lounge and, and other facilities. Uh, and that cluster cluster qualifies as a dwelling in its own right. So you, you might have an 800 bed student accommodation building that is actually is 100 apartments. And again, you can get the multiple dwellings relief on that if it's beneficial to do so. Yeah, quite. And I guess even putting those, those small kitchen units in, reasonably simple, if you can save that kind of level of, of staff duty then they'll pay for the kitchens in their own right anyway. So there's uh, yeah, a model. I think I think they cost about fifteen hundred pounds from B and Q, but don't quote me on that because I can <laughs> possibly tell you that I'd research that. Um, but yes, right. we did do. Okay, um, wonderful. Okay, Robin. Yes, indeed. Thank you, gents. Probably. Um, right. Let's see if we can get Ricky up. Um, hi, Ricky. Can you hear us? Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. How are you doing? Morning, gentlemen. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well. Excellent. Um, it was following up on my question that um, I put in the uh, the other box up, David, was in terms of we had a semi-detached building which we knocked down, had prior planning planning, planning on it and uh, built six flats off of that. So I just wanted to know, would that be uh, applicable for MDR? 
again, the point, did you have planning permission in place prior to completion of the purchase? Yes, we bought it with planning. In which case, yes, it would have been eligible for MDL. Oh, excellent. Great news. That's a great day. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Brilliant. Um, Thank you very much. We've got a link. In fact, I can put some links into the chat. Um, there's another question. I'm going to bring up the other question. Ricky, I'm going to just pop into the chat the, um, the link for setting your call up. If you want to pick up with um, David and his team to kind of get that moving forward. But let me... Yeah, um, Nadia wants to ask a question as well. So I'll get Nadia up. Um, hi, Nadia. You can hear us okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah David and, um, and, and Chris, basically my question is I'm in the middle of a project, which is a commercial, so it's a restaurant, derelict restaurant with a pub, uh, sorry, derelict restaurant with a flat upstairs. Mm -hmm. Now, the flat is uninhabitable because of mould. It does have a bathroom. It does have a kitchen, but you couldn't let it. Um, it's, it's a very small value compared to the case studies you've just shown. You know, we're talking about five and a half grand in SDLT. Is it still worth me investigating further with your good self to see if I could save something on that? Oh, always, Nadia. I mean, we're always happy, you know, we're always happy to look at deals. And, you know, if you're buying something that's got a restaurant on the ground floor, you're into mixed use straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the habitability or not of the apartment is probably not, I mean, it's useful, yeah. but it's no, no, it's a phrase nice to have, but not need to have. Uh, but you know, five and a half grand is five and a half grand. If, if that's tipping the value of the deal, then let us have a look at it. We don't charge for looking. Yeah, no, that's, that's great because the solicitors, as you said, don't seem to know. They've just quoted that as part of their, you know, paperwork <laughs> and, uh, and I was thinking, why don't they know the mixed use and uninhabitable use and that sort of thing? They said, oh, no, you have well, to pay those DLT. No, I, I, you know, solicitors are not tax experts. Let's be, for, let's be quite clear. Um, solicitors will always give you their estimate of SDLT. Um, but if you look carefully in the terms of business, they'll often say we're not giving tax advice. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, well, hang on. How did you come up with that number? Well, it was I use HMRC's calculator. Um, and frankly, HMRC have already admitted publicly, they did two years ago, that their calculator is only an estimator and you're supposed to do it properly. I think I'm quoting HMRC exactly on that. So it's always worth digging in a little bit. Um, unfortunately, solicitors have this problem and I'm, I'm, I'm not known as being solicitor friendly, nor am I known as being solicitor hostile. <laughs> um, but the Law Society requires a solicitor, when you engage, to send you a completion statement before they've even got the papers. And that mm. completion statement must include the SDLT. How are that's they supposed right. to know? Yeah. So I, th that's yeah. why I was thinking, exactly, you've taken the word out of my mouth, is because they're going to send me a completion statement with the SDLT in there. So yeah. how do I tell the solicitors I'm not paying that because I've got advice from Cornerstone or hopefully well, you can I, help I think, me out? I think what you do is you say to the sisters, look, I'm going to take some external tax advice on this and I'll come back to you. But frankly, okay. I mean, it, it, you know, you can always pay the money in and say, but I'm not authorizing you to pay that to HMRC until I've received tax advice. I mean, what they need to be, of course, is in funds to enable them to complete your purchase. That's yeah. the important thing. Um, so <laughs> it, it's more a sort of a holding answer until it doesn't really matter until completion, does it? That's what no. matters. We have to get it right on the day of completion. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, well, I'm just conscious of time, David. So really all that's left for me to do is to firstly um, thank you, David, for your time today and for your, um, for your great insights. Much appreciated. No, you're very welcome. And it's been lovely to appear with you again, Paul. Absolutely. And finally, just a thank you to... Um, thank you all for watching today. Um, had a good time today. Um, I've been Paul Davis. We've been Nimbus Maps. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. All the best. Bye for now.